Hi. Is your red the same as my red? Hey, Vsauce, we'll Michael here. This appears blue. This yes. appears yellow. And this appears green. Those of us with normal color vision can probably agree. But that doesn't change the fact that color is an illusion. Color as we know it does not exist in the outside world beyond us, like gravity or protons do. Instead, color is created inside our heads. Our brains convert a certain range of the electromagnetic spectrum into color. I can measure the wavelength of radiation, but I can't measure or observe the experience of a color inside your mind. Mm, when I read the title of this video, I was hoping it was going to be something like this. And now I'm curious how many of you are colorblind? Although I think it's more common in men, but if you are, weigh in. So how do I know that when you and me look at a strawberry and in my brain, this perception occurs, which I call red, that in yeah, your same. brain, a perception like this doesn't occur, which you have of course also learned to call red. We both call it red. We communicate effectively and walk away never knowing just how different each of our internal experiences really were. This is something I thought about so often as a child, but I had a really hard time articulating this concept, so I came off sounding very tinfoil hat, which drove me crazy. So it's exciting to see that there's actually a video speaking about this. Thanks for sending it in. Of course, we already know that not everybody sees color in exactly the same way. One example would be color blindness. But we can diagnose and discuss these differences because people with the conditions fail to see things that most of us can. Conceivably, though, there could be ways of seeing that we use that cause colors to look differently in different people's minds without altering their performances on any tests we could come up with. Of course, if that were the case, wouldn't some people think other colors looked better than others, or that some colors were more complementary we of others? Well, yeah, but doesn't that already happen? This matters because it shows how fundamentally, in terms of our perceptions, we are all alone in our minds. That point about perception can be applied to other examples as well. I always think about how two people could be seated on the same seated seated on the same sofa experiencing the same event but somehow come out of that with two very different understandings of what happened and i've seen that scenario play out firsthand and i think a lot of that may have to do with our past experiences associations understandings projections the info stored in our minds and then how that affects how we see things Hmm. Let's say I met an alien from a far away solar system who, lucky enough, could speak English, but had never and could never feel pain. I could explain to the alien that pain is sent through A delta and C fibers to the spinal cord. The alien could learn every single cell and pathway and process and chemical involved in the feeling of pain. The alien could pass a biology exam about pain and believe that pain to us generally is a bad thing. But no matter how much he learned, the alien would never actually feel pain. Pain is a tough one. If I were speaking to someone who doesn't know pain, and then for some reason I couldn't give them the dictionary definition or that didn't explain it enough to them, I wouldn't have the easiest time trying to explain it. Because it's physical and then also emotional and there are varying degrees of pain. Sometimes it's one of those constant dull feelings that you can live with. Sometimes it's debilitating. From arthritis to phantom limb, deep sadness, aching, burning, cramping. I'd be there all day trying to explain pain and I'd probably get too philosophical with it, which happens. <laughs> Philosophers call these ineffable raw feelings qualia. 
And our oh, inability no. to connect physical phenomenon to these raw feelings, our inability to explain and share our own internal qualia, is known as the explanatory gap. This mm. gap is confronted when describing color to someone who has been blind their entire life. Tommy Edison has never been able to see. He has a YouTube channel nice where he describes what being blind is like. It's an amazing channel. In one video, he talks about colors and how strange and foreign of a concept it seems to him. Sighted people try to explain, for instance, that red is hot and blue is cold. But to someone who has never seen a single color, that just seems weird. And as he explains, it has never caused him to finally see a color. Some philosophers, like Daniel Dennett, argue that qualia may be private and ineffable simply because of a failure of our own language, not because mm. they are necessarily always going to be impossible to share. There may be an alien race that communicates in a language that causes colors to appear in your brain without your retina having to be involved at all, or without you having to have ever needed to actually see the color yourself. Perhaps even in English, he says, given millions and billions of words used in just the right way, it may be possible to adequately describe a color such that a blind person could see it for the first time. Or you could figure out that once and for all, yes, or no, in fact, you and your friend do not see the same red. But for now... I'm still thinking about how he described red. If I go out on a sunny day and close my eyes, the color that I see behind my eyelids is what I call red. And bursts of what I call yellow. Just me, or...? Oh, it remains the case that we have no way of knowing if my red is the same as your red. Maybe one day our language will allow us to maybe. share and find out. Or maybe it never will. I know it's frustrating to not have an answer, but the mere fact that you guys can ask me about my internal experiences, and the mere fact that I can ask my friends and we can all collectively wonder at the concept of qualia is quite incredible and also quite human. Animals can do all sorts of clever things that we do. They can use tools, problem solve, communicate, cooperate, exhibit curiosity, plan for the future. And although we can't know for sure, many animals certainly act as if they feel emotions, loneliness, fear, joy. Apes have even been taught to use language to talk to us humans. It's a sort of sign language that they've used to do everything from answer questions to express emotion or even produce novel thoughts. Unlike any other animal, these apes are able to understand language and form responses at about the level of a two and a half year old human child. But there's something that no signing ape has ever done. No ape has ever asked a question. Oh, why? Joseph Jordania's Who Asked the First Question is a great read on this topic, and it's available for free online. For as long as we have been able to use sign language to communicate with apes, they have never wondered out loud about anything that we might know that they don't. Of course, this does not mean that apes and plenty of other animals aren't curious. They obviously are. But what it yeah. suggests is that they lack a theory of mind, an understanding that other people have separate minds, that they have knowledge, access to information that you might not have. Even us humans aren't born with a theory of mind. And there's a famous experiment to test when a human child first develops a theory of mind. It is called the Sally Ann test. During the test, researchers tell children a story about Sally and Ann. Sally and Ann have a box and a basket in their room. They also happen to have a delicious cookie. Now Sally takes the cookie and puts it inside the box. And then Sally leaves the room. While Sally is gone, Ann comes over to the box, 
takes the cookie out and puts the cookie inside the basket. Now, when Sally comes back, the researchers ask the children, where will Sally look for the cookie? Obviously, no Sally the will box. look in the box. That's where she left it. She has no way of knowing what Anne did while she was gone. But until the yeah. age of about four, children will insist that Sally will check the basket. Because after all, that's where Curious. the cookie is. The child saw Anne move the cookie, so why wouldn't Sally also know? Young children fail to realize that Sally's mental representation of the situation, her access to information, can be different than their own. And apes who know sign language but never ask us questions are doing the same thing. They're failing to recognize that other individuals have similar cognitive abilities and can be used as sources of information. So, we are all alone with our perceptions. We are alone in our own minds. We can both agree that chocolate tastes good, but I cannot climb into your consciousness and experience what chocolate tastes like to you. Mm. I good can point. never know if my red looks the same as your red, but I can ask. So stay human. Stay curious and let the entire world know that you are. And as always, thanks for watching. Wow, he's a very expressive communicator. I genuinely learned a lot from that video, and he gave some pretty thought-provoking questions as well. So, thank you for the subscriber request. It's from a channel called Vsauce. First time watching. I liked it very much. So if you have any other videos from this channel that you want to recommend, let me know. But I like that he said that there wasn't an answer, only the ability to ask more questions. For me, it was also a dive into the shortcomings, complexity, and general importance of language, which is a subject I like anyway. And the Sally Ann experiment, which I'll probably read more of after this, had me thinking of solipsism as well for some reason there. But I can appreciate a video that touches on quite a few concepts and then explains them first easy enough for me to understand, but also gives me subjects to research after this. So I'm sure the next few hours I won't only be looking at color theory, but I'd never heard of qualia before either, so that's something I need to learn about. That just made me think of how relative perception is. And so much of the human experience is contingent on and confined to our own minds. So a fitting recommendation, literary recommendation, while he was speaking, I thought of this book. It's called The Sound and the Fury by William Faulkner. It follows four characters through what I'd call a tragedy, I suppose. Three brothers, one narrator. And each have very different perspectives on the events. Sometimes so much so that you have to wonder, oh, are they incredibly biased or unreliable? And then the reader has to sort of put the puzzle pieces together to try to decipher what really happened. But I think the writing style is what really got me into that book. It's not linear at all, which I think made it fun to read. So if you've ever read that book, let me know if you liked it. And I'll of course link it down below for you. If I can find the free audiobook version, I'll link that as well. Let me know your thoughts on any of this. Thanks for watching with me. I'll catch you next time.